Good morning. Good morning. On a rainy day, we welcome you to our service this morning. Tenth Sunday in the Trinity season after Trinity, kind of symbolic, I guess, because we come to the end of the commandments today, the Ten Commandments on the tenth Sunday after Trinity. The thoughts that are in our service today in the lessons have to do with the accountability that God gives to us regarding the gifts in which he has blessed our lives, which also in many ways ties in with the ninth and the tenth commandment about coveting, that we are content with the things that the Lord has given and use them to his glory and our good. Also with the ninth and the tenth commandments now, you know there are different numberings to the commandments. I mentioned that when we began. Uh, if you're interested in why there are different numberings, there are two main numberings to the commandments as far as which commandment goes with which number. Um, but there are actually four or more different numberings to that. If you're interested in that history as to how that came about, because in the scriptures itself, God does not say this is commandment number one, this is commandment number two, this is commandment number three. But he does say the Ten Commandments. So there's a little sheet of paper that's on the uh, uh, um, stand out there where the bulletins are if you're interested in knowing the history of that and why the different numberings and how that came about. What we follow with many of the Western churches that are of the historical background is that which was set up by St. Augustine in the 400s. So that gives you a little bit of a background to that if you're interested in that at all. So Commandments 9 and 10 we use together today in our sermon. We begin our service with the singing of our opening hymn. We'll use setting one without Holy Communion today on page 154. And our opening hymn is hymn number 620, O Worship the King.
please rise as we follow the order of service setting one on page 154. And the confession of sins we use today will be found on page 155. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. And we reflect on those words. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. In the peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory be to The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, you reveal your mighty power chiefly in showing mercy and kindness. 
Grant us the full measure of your grace that we may obtain your promises and become partakers of your heavenly glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. And we turn our attention to the scripture lessons for the day. If you care to follow along, you'll find them printed on the back side of your bulletin. In a type of continuation of the lessons from last week, which spoke of the uh, gifts of God's grace and the stewardship of that in our lives, it also continues this week with the idea of the accountability that we have before God, before the gifts with which he has blessed us. Our first lesson, the Old Testament lesson, is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 7, verses 1 through 11. Towards the end of this lesson, you'll notice when we get to the gospel that Jesus utilizes that last verse when he speaks about robbing him and his house. The children of Israel were given so many gifts, but they always went apart from God, and so they were being held accountable by God here for the gifts that he had given to them as he reminds them and chastises them for the way that they had misused them and warns them to return to him. We read in Jeremiah chapter 7. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand in the gate of the house of the Lord and proclaim this message there. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who are coming through this gate to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will establish you in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Sincerely reform your ways and your actions. Carry out justice between a man and his neighbor. Do not oppress the alien who lives in your land, the fatherless or the widow. Do not shed innocent blood in this place. Do not follow after other gods to your own harm. If you avoid these things, I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your fathers forever and ever. Take warning. You are trusting in deceptive words that cannot help you. Will you steal and murder? commit adultery and swear falsely? Will you offer sacrifices to Baal and follow other gods you do not know? Will you come and stand before me in this temple that bears my name and say, we are safe the whole time you do all these detestable things? This house bears my name. Have you made it a den of robbers? Watch out. I myself have been watching, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we join together now in a responsive singing of the psalm for the day. That'll be Psalm 100. Psalm 100 in the front part of the hymnal. Psalm 100 speaks of the joy that the believer has in entering God's house as is different from the children of Israel, both in the Old Testament lesson and the Gospel lesson for the day, uh, who abused God's house. Here the believer enjoys God's house and uses it to God's glory and to his own good. We'll sing responsively the psalm. Jane will play through the refrain portion. Uh, I will sing the refrain portion, and then we'll have you join in the singing of the refrain. Now, every time she plays the refrain, you notice there's also a little bit of an introduction that comes. She will play that each time. Then I will sing the first set of verses. Join me in the singing of the refrain again, and then join me in the singing of the rest of the verses, and the glory be to the Father. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. 
Join me in the refrain. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. The second lesson today is the epistle lesson from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Paul speaks of the variety of gifts that the Lord gives to his church for their unity and for their growth in the spirit, and that they would use them to his glory and in the way that he gave them. We read in 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were deceived and somehow led away to mute idols. Therefore, I am informing you that no one speaking by God's spirit says, a curse be upon Jesus. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are various kinds of gifts but the same spirit. There are different kinds of ministries, yet the same Lord. There are various kinds of activity, but the same God produces all of them in everyone. Each person is given a manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one person, a message of wisdom is given by the spirit. To another, a message of knowledge, as the same spirit provides it. By the same spirit, faith is given to someone else, and to another, the same spirit gives healing gifts. Another is given powers to do miracles, another the gift of prophecy, another the evaluating of spirits, someone else different kinds of tongues, and another the interpretation of tongues. One and the same spirit produces all of these, distributing them to each one individually as he desires. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And before the reading of the gospel, we join in the gospel acclamation for the day, page 161. Today we'll use God's love in the verse. Lord, for his love and the faithfulness. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. 
The gospel lesson for the day is recorded in the book of Luke, chapter 19, beginning at verse 41. Jesus is now entering Jerusalem as he is getting set, really, for his crucifixion and resurrection. This comes the week before that takes place. But as he enters Jerusalem, he is saddened by what he sees, and we hark back to the Old Testament lesson today also. As the people had abused the temple in the Old Testament times, so they had abused God's house when Jesus was here. He reads in, we read in Luke chapter 19. As he came near, he saw the city and wept over it. He said, if you, yes you, had only known on this day the things that would bring peace to you, but now it is hidden from your eyes. In fact, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. Within your walls, they will dash you and your children to the ground, and within your walls, they will not leave one stone on top of another, because you did not recognize the time when God came to help you. Jesus entered the temple courts and began to drive out those who were selling things there. He told them, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching in the temple courts, but the chief priests, the experts in the law, and the leaders of the people continued to look for a way to put him to death. They could not find any way to do it because all the people were clinging to him and listening. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. The congregation may be seated as we continue with the singing of the sermon hymn for the day, hymn number 717, What is the World to Me?
Grace be yours and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we end the series on the commandments, the commandments themselves with the ninth and the tenth. In your bulletin you have an insert with both the ninth and the tenth commandment on that. If you would take that out at this time. Okay, now we have two commandments here. So we'll read through both of them. One of the commandments, the ninth commandment, deals with, I guess, the, the reason for the separation of these rather than making them one is that it deals with things that are not alive, all right? Those things which are material things. And the tenth commandment deals with those things that are living. So that is the difference between them. Coveting it means the same in either case. So if you would join with me in the reading of the commandment and then the explanation. First, the ninth commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we may not craftily seek to get our neighbor's inheritance or house and obtain it by a show of justice and right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. And the tenth. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor as manservant, nor as maidservant, nor as cattle, nor anything that is his. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we may not estrange, force, or entice away our neighbor's wife, servant, or cattle, but urge them to stay and diligently do their duty. In Christ Jesus, their fellow redeemed in our Lord. Years ago, we had a dog that was named Maggie. When she was young, she would chase anything that flew past her. Birds, butterflies, bees. She'd run after them and snap at them. If it had wings and it passed her, she ran after it. She didn't need it. She didn't really lack anything. We gave her plenty to eat. Still, she kept chasing. Funny thing. I never saw her catch anything. Many of our wishes and the things that we set our hearts upon are like dogs chasing bees. We don't get what we wish for. Usually no harm is really done in that. But there are those times that we wish for things that God does not will us to have and we teeter then on the brink of covetousness. So, what is covetousness? Coveting is overreaching. Coveting is lusting after things that we don't have. Coveting is the evil desire for people or for worldly goods that belong to someone else making those things and the attaining of them the goal of our lives. Coveting is discontent to the highest degree so that I seek to get those things that are not mine. Coveting, in the end, is actually idolatry, for it takes my heart away from God and his blessings to me, and it centers it on worldly things that he has not given as with the breaking of the other eight commandments, we have come really full circle here to the first commandment. We are to have a single heart's desire, the Lord and his goodness to us. Nothing in our hearts should ever rise above him. So it is that when we look at these last two commandments, we pray, Lord, may thy will be done in our lives that we keep our hearts pure and content on you. You know, it's very much a part of our fallen nature that we do not desire another person to possess more than what we have, according to our fallen nature. That fallen human nature wants to secure as much as it can for itself without any regard to what our neighbor's best interests might be. So here again, as in the seventh commandment, which is against stealing, God forbids us to deprive our neighbor of anything of his own, even if 
the eyes of the world would consider it honorably done, for people want to be thought of as good and upright among the righteous people of this world. So it is that in coveting, people are tempted to dress themselves in fine-looking outer clothing to conceal their own uh, dishonesty within. Oh, the clever ways that the world has and invents to defraud the neighbor of his goods, the blessings that God has given to that person. And quite often it's done under the guise of justice. You see that happening in our world today because it's done in a more subtle way than by outright stealing the neighbor's property. Laws are distorted or they're stretched for one's own gain and it often leads to the breaking of other commandments along the way. For example, in the days of the prophet Elijah, in the Old Testament times. Ahab was the king in Israel. In his heart, he did not make God and God's blessings to him the goal of his life. Although he lived in a house that was lined with ivory and gold, Ahab was discontented, and he was desirous of more material things. His wife Jezebel was even worse than he was. Near the palace lived a man by the name of Naboth. Naboth owned a beautiful piece of property with a very nice vineyard and very nice gardens. Ahab wanted that. However, Naboth did not want to sell it because it had been in his family for a very long time. Ahab offered to buy it, which was okay, but Naboth did not want to get rid of it. So the king went home, and he pouted for not receiving what he had desired and what he coveted. Jezebel, his wife, made plans then to get it for him. She wrote letters to the city officials, and she filled that letter with lies about Naboth. The letter said that Naboth had cursed the king and had cursed God. In the Old Testament times, that was liable for death, for execution. Her false witness to the court prompted the officials to grab Naboth. And in the end, they did execute him. As soon as Naboth died, Ahab grabbed possession of the vineyard that he had coveted. So Ahab's coveting of Naboth's property, that's against the 10th commandment, the 9th commandment, led to cursing and false oaths against the 2nd commandment. That led to lies in court, the 8th commandment. That led to a righteous execution, perhaps, but it was actually murder, the 5th commandment. And with Naboth out of the way, the property was stolen or taken by Ahab. That was not his. That's the seventh commandment. So as with the breaking of every commandment that takes place, Ahab did not make God in the carrying out of God's gifts the goal of his life, which is a breaking of the first commandment. So look how the discontent and the evil desires that are within the fallen human heart can lead to a domino effect in uh, breaking the commandments. As Ahab lived apart from God, so Ahab died apart from God eternally. With these commandments, these last two, God addresses our hearts, just as he has really done throughout the commandments. Set your heart on him. Fear, love, and trust in him above all things. Fear, love, and trust in him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your mind. That constraining love of God as well as the restraining fear of God will keep your heart from covetousness that takes your heart away from him. 
Nothing must rise above him within us. As the Apostle Paul wrote in last week's epistle lesson from 1 Corinthians, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they, the children of Israel, did. Do not be idolaters. We should not test the Lord. Do not grumble. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No testing has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. See, like a kind and a wise father who knows our weakness in thinking that things are always greener on the other side of the fence from us, God commands simply, you shall not covet, whether it be inanimate, material possessions, or a neighbor's spouse, or workers, or any other living thing that he owns. So when we fall to this, let us run to Christ, who has been tempted in every way, even along these lines, just as we are, yet he was without sin. And our hearts are set again then on sorrowful repentance in him, then his forgiveness that comes to us from the cross and his righteousness from his life will fill our lives once more and purify our hearts within, and it will help us to stand against evil. He promises that he's going to provide a way out so that we can stand up under it. That's God's promise to all who believe and trust his word. So may we find peace of mind and of heart and conscience and purity within ourselves. Make him and his blessings to you the goal of life because only he can keep our hearts pure within. And then we'll be able to live in godly contentment with what he has given to each of us. Contentment, that's the antidote to covetousness. The Apostle Paul, who might himself have struggled with this temptation of covetousness in his own life, writes of this experience that he had in Romans chapter 7. He says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, for I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. See, the secret of keeping our hearts pure is contentment, godly contentment. Paul continues with that thought when he writes further, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. And in such contentment, the hand of the Lord will be upon us. So what is godly contentment like? John Newton, the man who wrote Amazing Grace, described contentment this way. If two angels came down from heaven to carry out a divine command from God, and one of them was appointed to sweep the streets, while the other was appointed to a high and a noble position and task, they would feel no inclination at all to change their employments. What did he mean by that? Why wouldn't they feel any inclination to change their appointments? because each of them would have that sure conviction that what he was doing was what the Lord had given him to do, and that by his service, whether it be great or humble, he was glorifying God. That's living in godly contentment with what the Lord has given. No matter what situation in life God has chosen for you, no matter what he has given you or what service that he wants you to render to him, you can find joy in the choices that he has given you. There's no need to chase after birds and butterflies and bees. 
For what he gives to you is the pathway along which he has chosen to lead you to glory in him. No matter what material possessions he gives, it is enough. And we find joy knowing that he has given us what we exactly need and what he knows that we need. With it, he will guide us down the pathway that leads to eternal glory. I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstances. For the one who holds to Christ as the Savior is what Paul means here. He already has the most priceless treasure here on earth. Nothing that we could ever desire or want could begin to match the eternal life that the Savior has won for us. Neither rust, nor moth, nor thief can ever take that from you. In love for Christ and in obedience to his commandment, we can say with the hymnist in the hymn you just sang, what is the world to me with all of its vaunted pleasures when thou and thou alone, Lord Jesus, art my treasure? Thou only dearest Lord, my heart's desire shall be. Thou art my peace, my rest. What is the world to me? And to that end we pray, Lord, may we keep your will and may it be done by us that we keep our hearts pure and content upon you. God, grant that in our lives of faith for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please remain standing as we join together with all Christians in confessing our faith. Today we do that in the words of the Apostles' Creed, as you'll find that on page 163 in the front of the hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. The congregation may be seated, but if you would keep your hymnals open to the next page, 164, as before the offering, we join together in the responsive prayer of the church. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity, we thank you especially for bringing Lois back from the hospital, and we ask that you would continue to provide her with healing over the days and the weeks that lie ahead. 
Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. And now hear us, Lord, as we each pray in silence. Lord God, you are the giver of every gift in our lives. Yet in sin we are often unsatisfied and long to have more and better things that you have given. Turn our sinful hearts and our covetous hearts away from selfish game so that we truly appreciate and rejoice in the abundant blessings you shower upon us. Home, food, clothing, possessions, and the people in life. But best of all, you have given us your Son as the Savior. So grant us contentment, joy, and peace in these daily blessings through faith in him. And we remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus who died and rose again. Amen. And we now worship our Lord in bringing our offerings to him. And for our offering hymn today, our next hymn, we join in the singing of hymn 942, Create in me a clean heart, O God. 942. Please rise for prayer and the blessing as we turn to page 171 in your hymnal. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you would have us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we join in the prayer the Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
and now receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. The congregation may be seated as we join in the singing of our closing hymn, 808, Drawn to the Cross, 808. Again, we welcome you to our service today and pray that you've been strengthened in your faith by God's word. Please make note of the announcements for today. We'll have the council, the elders, and the trustees meeting this week on Tuesday, so note the times that are in there. Then we invite you to remain following our service for a time of fellowship and refreshments and for our Bible study time. Thank you.